check. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to week two. Um, so before we go do a recap of what we covered last week, let's just open in prayer. Does anyone online want to open us in prayer? Okay, if you're unable to unmute, then yeah, someone on campus can open. Thank you, Father God, for this time, for this class. We surrender everything in your hand. Uh, guide us, help us by your Holy Spirit, and uh, uh, give us wisdom and knowledge so that we can understand your teaching, God. We surrender everything in your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So um, let's just do a small recap of what we did last week, and then we'll go into um, some stuff for this week. So what did we talk about last week? I know we did a recap of the first class. We talked about what are revivals, visitations, and moves of God. Um, anyone want to say a little bit about that? Um, in the book of Acts, like we saw, um, how God moved and, and like, why did he move? Because, uh, they had, uh, they were in unity and, um, and they were praying steadfastly. And so, which is the reason why God moved and showed his power there. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And any, anything that you can recall about what, uh, what are some features of revival? What are some things that are typically seen when we see God moving? Um, because of the revival, uh, the people will change and the community, it's mm -hmm. like a ripple effect mm -hmm. on uh, everybody involved. It's not just one and it continues. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, it's not only the people within the church, but also uh, people outside the church are impacted and there's transformation that's seen. And the work that is started is uh, a long lasting work. It doesn't end with that season of revival. Thank you. Anything else? Any other? Okay, um, Chira said revival is bringing life. Thank you. Yeah, revival is bringing something that is dead back to life. Anything you all see as a need um, for the church today, like something that revival brings that you think we need right now in our church, in our church as in the global church, yeah. Uh, I feel like in this present day church, like we need to um, um, let our spirits be revived. Like we need a fresh wind, fresh fire from God, and um, in order to realize. And I, I mean, I don't think like we've all uh, experienced like uh, God's glory, especially being in His presence. And uh, if if we experience that, maybe you might start worshiping Him in spirit and truth. And um, yeah, yeah, I think. Uh... Yeah, and uh, Nina shared online a greater revelation of who God is. Yeah, it is when we encounter God's glory and his presence in a new way that um, worship is an automatic uh, response to that presence of God. And so, um, yeah, Rain just shared that that is one need within the church today. 
Okay, so uh, before we go into today's content, I, I had said that I would share a little bit about uh, the first assignment. So I'll do that and then we'll go into, um, yeah, our content for today. So uh, in this assignment, we're just going to be looking at different people who were part of revival movements uh, from the second century onward to the present day church. So what I'm going to ask you all to do is to take someone that is mentioned in the book. OK, so there's uh, people from right from the second century church to the 2000s, uh, different people who are named and what their contribution was to the revival. So you can pick anyone from that whole. It's a long period of time. Uh, and then I will ask you to research something about that person. So we're not going to present what's in the book, but uh, you can take this, but also do research in addition to it. Um, and once you are, once you have your sources, if you can share that with me, so I'll know what are the sources you're using in your research. Okay, so just to make sure that we are using reliable resources, uh, that whatever we are getting. Uh, in terms of that person, what they did, how they contributed, uh, is from a reliable source. So find reliable sources, and you can email them to me. Um, I think from Google Classroom, you're able to send that to me, right? You all can send it to me on Google Classroom uh, so that I know what the sources are that you all are using. And the main things that I'm going to ask you all to research is what was that person's spiritual journey? So we want to know. How did they encounter God? What uh, was it that God did in their life? And how did they contribute to God's uh, work in building his church? OK, so those are the two aspects. What was their personal spiritual journey? And how did they uh, impact God's work in the church? OK, um, so how we're going to present i'm going to ask each of you to present for just five minutes so it's a short presentation okay so when you're preparing your content just time yourselves and see if it's coming to over five minutes and like i'm five minutes is just too short you can let me know uh, but we'll try and keep it short because if each person is going to present then we'll need a lot of time okay so uh, just a short presentation. You can use a PPT if you want. You don't have to. Uh, you can just like come and share it to the class. For those online, um, would that be possible for you all, or would it be difficult for you to uh, present during the class? I'll post it on Google Classroom. Yeah, I just wanted to share it here. Huh. Uh, we'll do it over a few weeks. So we'll do a few people each week. OK, so I've given uh, on Google Classroom, I've given you all the dates. So you all just tell me who you all are presenting on. Maybe if you can let me know before next week who you're presenting on and what sources you're using. And then I'll kind of give each person a date. Yes, a person from the book. Uh, you can use what is here about them, but also add outside. You will choose the same person, yeah. So whoever has given me the name first will get priority. <laughs> so choose quickly. <laughs> OK, so uh, uh, the question was for those online, sorry. If there's an overlap, like somebody has already selected the person that you wanted to present on, um, then whoever has come to me first with that name will get, and you will have to choose another person. So give me the name quickly, and um, and then I can tell you when you can present and all of that. OK. So uh, Anthony, yes, during the class, I would like uh, each person to present. I've given a few dates on Google Classroom. So you can let me know if there's some date you are not able to present or something. You can let me know in advance so that I won't schedule you for that date. OK. Uh, so 
uh, in your presentation, you're just going to be sharing that person's spiritual journey, how they contributed to the church, to uh, God's work in the church. And um, the grading will basically be on what research you've done, like how good is your research, on whether you did your work on time, uh, and how clear was your presentation. Those are the three things. Yeah, you can create a PPT if you want, but it's not required. Whatever, if you want to just speak, you can just speak. OK. Is that, uh, yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to um, email me or post on Google Classroom. Right? OK, so uh, if you are nervous about like speaking in front of people and you feel like your presentation is not going to be as good as it would be in a written format, then you can also submit your written work. So you can do both. You can present in class and submit written work. But if you're OK with just presenting, then you can just present. OK, yes. OK, so uh, um, what you'll be doing is you'll be picking some person from the book, some person who's named. Uh, from the second century to present day church, someone who uh, was a part of some revival. Okay, so all the people named here are people who, in some way, contributed or were part of revival movements. Uh, and so you will be looking at what was their personal spiritual journey and what did they do specifically to, in the revivals that they were a part of, what did they do? How did they? How were they involved? OK. So Pastor, uh, we have to like, show you the, the, the classroom. Uh, uh, that is who you've chosen, the person you want to present on. You can just post that. You can send it to me on Google Classroom. I'm not like I haven't used. I think there's a way to send me a private message, right, on Google Classroom. So y'all can do that. Then everyone can see it. Mm. Meaning where you're going to be, what your source is for research, or? OK. Yeah. Yeah, feel free to post it directly on Google Classroom or to email me or send me a message on uh, Google Classroom, whatever, just so that uh, I know who you've picked. Um, and I think Nina asked for the time frame. So on Google Classroom, I've put the schedule there. So September 4th, 11th, and 18th. Uh, when we'll do the student presentations, OK? OK. Reply to that. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah, you'll have to share a screen. Yeah. So I think we'll probably, uh, I can find out the technical side of it. But if you want, if you're using a PPT, then we can figure that out. OK. The names? I think page 30. Yeah, page 29 is where the second century starts. So page 29 to page 60. OK, you can pick anyone from there. What is it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So some of them, there's very little information in the book, but you will find a lot of information online. So uh, yeah, whichever you you can choose someone who I, I want you all to also add information from outside the book. So whoever you pick, you can 
do that for. OK, so yeah, any questions, you all can uh, reach out to me outside of class. And all questions answered for now, no? <laughs> OK. OK, so let's go into today's discussion. Uh, <laughs> which is that page? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. No, Satish Kumar. Yeah. Okay. Where is that? Okay. 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 So uh, feel free to just like. If you're, uh, I don't, is my email ID, I'll have to post my email ID on Google Classroom. Okay, I can do that. So if you want to email me, you can do that as well. Okay. So let us go to Acts. Uh, we were looking at the book of Acts and um, seeing how God had moved in the book of Acts uh, through the first church that was started. And then through uh, Paul as well, so we didn't we didn't go all the way there, but uh, so Acts two to eight is where we were looking at how the community that that first set of believers received the Holy Spirit and what were some things that uh, was manifested, how God's glory was manifested among those believers uh, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. Uh, so that's on page eight. Now, there are several points that are mentioned there about different things that were seen among those believers when the Holy Spirit uh, was poured out on them. Uh, I just kind of summarized that into three different categories. So one was how did it affect their relationship with God? Uh, how did it affect their relationship with one another within the church? And then how did it affect their relationship with those? outside the church. Uh, so those are the three ways uh, we can look at this um, this early church, the first church. Uh, the first thing is in their relationship with God, uh, there were angelic visitations. So um, we see in Acts 5, 19 and 20, Acts 8, 26, where angels were sent to give a message, to give instructions, to bring deliverance uh, to uh, people who were imprisoned. So uh, we see basically angels being very prominent in the work that God was doing. Uh, the second in their relationship with God, with God was that there was a fear of God and a reverence for God that the church had um, in a new way. Right, so they were when they were gathering for worship. Uh, if someone can read Acts two forty three. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. OK, so um, they were seeing these signs and wonders, and the response was uh, fear and a reverence for God. OK, and uh, so that was one other aspect of their relationship with God. The other the, was that there was teaching and there was prayer. So they were gathering together to learn more from the scriptures, and they were gathering together to pray. Um, so all of these were the ways in which they were pursuing God, the ways in which they were growing in their relationship with God. Uh, the other aspect was how were they relating to one another within the church? Uh, there was fellowship, 
Okay, so they were meeting regularly, day by day, is, uh, when they were going, uh, gathering together, there was fellowship, there was sharing of belongings, so people were even selling their possessions and sharing uh, with those in need. So that was the level at which there was unity, not only in spirit, but also unity in uh, the community of like everything that we have belongs to one another. Uh, there was, uh, there were new people being raised up, new believers being raised up in the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, not only were new believers coming in, but they were uh, growing in the Holy Spirit and they were being sent out. And then um, there was uh, peace in the relationships that existed within the church. So even if dis disputes arose, the way they dealt with it was in a peaceful way. So we read in Acts 6, 1 to 7, where there was a dispute within the church and how they responded to it. So it's not to say that there were no disagreements, there were no problems. It is how were they responding and how they were dealing with disputes that arose. Um, and then how was their relationship to those outside the church? Uh, so the influence of the church was spreading. This is something that we talked about, right? So uh, revival doesn't stay within the church. It impacts the society it's in. So their influence was spreading. People were coming from outside uh, to see what God was doing in the church. Um, and then influence was spreading to even leadership. Uh, so we see um, that the priests of that day, if we read in Acts 6, 7, the priests who were actually opposing them then come to faith and start to believe in Jesus. Uh, and then we see uh, leaders, other leaders like Saul, the Ethiopian eunuch, people who were in positions of power who were coming to faith in Christ. Um, we see uh, that they responded to persecution with increased boldness and courage. So even though from the outside uh, there was opposition to their faith, they were able to continue in their faith with more boldness, with more courage. Um, we see signs and wonders being done in not only within the church but outside the church. And then we see new believers being added to the church daily. Okay, so uh, all of these are um, things that we can expect to see in revival, right? So revival affects our relationship with God. So we pursue him through prayer. We pursue him through um, increased learnings and studying of the scripture. Uh, we have a greater awe and reverence for God. Um, and there is... There are other spiritual disciplines that we start to practice. So there's fasting, all of those things. Um, and then there is unity in relationships within the body. There is uh, sharing within the body. There is gathering to worship. Uh, there's fellowship within the body. Uh, there is evidence of God's work in our midst. So there's um, oneness in spirit. And then there is impact in the society around us. So there, there are leaders being sent out. There is impact in the leadership in society. Uh, there are new believers being brought into the church. Um, and there are people being sent out in the power of the Holy Spirit. So there are people coming in and there are people going out uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit to spread that revival. Uh, and these are things that we should be seeing in the church all the time. Okay, so uh, this is not like one-off when revival happens, but this should be the way the church operates all the time, ideally. Okay, uh, so while we want to continue the ministry work that we are doing, we want to continue those kinds of things, uh, our uh, everyday operation should be in this place of God's glory, God's glory being manifested in our midst. So then we move from those first eight years to the next 10 years, which is from Acts 8 to 13. Uh, and this is where, from that first community encountering the Holy Spirit, to then how that community takes revival to other places. This is what those 10 years, the next 10 years encompasses, how revival spread from that community 
to other communities. Okay, so the main reason why it spreads is because persecution arises in the church in Jerusalem, okay, which is where the first church started. Uh, so they experience persecution and all of them are scattered to different places. And then they begin to start churches wherever they are. Uh, and the main thing is that as they go to all of these places, the same things that were happening in Jerusalem starts to happen in these other places. So that is uh, how we can say that that revival was spreading. Because what we are seeing here starts to happen there. Okay, and that same, the same kinds of characteristics, the same DNA of what was the church in Jerusalem is seen in the new churches that are started. Uh, so the some of the main things that happen in these next 10 years, uh, we see first in Acts 9, uh, so that's AD 38 to AD 47. So right at the start of those first 10 years is when Saul comes to faith. Okay, so Saul encounters Jesus. Uh, so from someone who is opposing the work that God is doing, he does a U-turn and he starts to follow Jesus. Uh, the next thing is that new churches are starting to be built. So, oh, I didn't realize that y'all won't be able to see. I had some maps that I was going to share, but... Um, Y'all can, okay. So I'll just share these uh, things so that y'all know the places that we are talking about. Okay, so this uh, this first map, everyone's able to see it? Yeah? Okay, so this first map is actually Acts 2 to 8. Uh, this is where all of those believers from different places had come to Jerusalem. Uh, and they hear, uh, I mean, they are there for the Pentecost. And so um, people from all these places then go back and all of these places are impacted. Uh, so we see right up to Rome, um, which is on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea, and um, all of these different parts of Asia, uh, all of these different cities and areas. Uh, so Egypt, Libya, all of that is impacted because there are uh, Jewish believers who've come to Jerusalem at the time of the Pentecost. Um, now for the second part that we are looking at those next 10 years, I'll just share that, sorry. Okay, I'm just sharing the second map. Are you all able to see that? Yes, okay. Uh, Shiv Kumar, are you able to see that? Okay, just let me know if you're having some trouble. Okay. Um, others in the online classroom, and all the people in class are able to see it. So, um, 
ओके 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 शिव कुमार इट सीम्स लाइक देर मे बी सम इश्यू ऑन योर साइड सो व्हाट आई डू इज आई विल जस्ट पोस्ट इट ऑन गूगल क्लासरूम एज वेल एंड देन यू कैन जस्ट uh i'm posting it on the stream the link so you can look at it from there and then i'll post it later when i share when the lecture is posted i'll also share the same link i posted it on the stream on google classroom as well okay so um uh, this uh kind of covers some of those initial uh moves that happened with uh different people who were going out and planting churches or uh, going out and sharing the gospel so we see philip's journeys shared here on this map uh we see um paul's uh initial travels before his uh convert i mean before his for second missionary journey before the larger journeys that started this is one of his initial our uh, travels and then we see peter's early ministry as well um so if we look at philip's ministry uh he went uh to samaria he went to lydda can you all see all of that when i'm zooming in you're able to see right okay so he went to gaza he went basically along this coast uh to a few places he went to caesarea so that's uh, all of where philip went starting from jerusalem he went to all of these places and then uh, peter is the dotted line so peter went to uh, where is is peter the yeah the red dotted line yeah so peter went to joppa he went to caesarea um and then i think that's all of peter and then the rest of it is what paul did so paul went from jerusalem he went up to uh damascus and this is his first journey right on the way to damascus is where he encounters jesus and then from damascus he goes to arabia from arabia he goes back to damascus from damascus he goes back to jerusalem uh we'll read a little bit more about what he does in each place from jerusalem he goes to lydda from lydda to caesarea and from caesarea he goes to tarsus so you can see this is the initial those first 10 years this is where a lot of the um work is spreading because people are going out uh but there were also people who were uh, dispersed because of the persecution so they went to other places but this is mostly uh where some of the early uh, the apostles and philip who was uh, one of the early church uh leaders traveled with the gospel okay so um so as people traveled we can see that the churches within these places started to grow they were thriving there was uh like god was working supernaturally in all of these places uh so that lida and joppa there was a church there that uh grew in like grew and was thriving uh then we see that peter went um so peter when he went to caesarea is where god speaks to him through a vision so peter when he goes here is where he goes to the roman centurion right so what happens anyone want to recount that for us and peter goes this is the first gentile who is ministered to yes yeah so this is the story of cornelius cornelius is praying and um god speaks to him and asks him to send his servants to peter and god simultaneously speaks to peter in a vision and um and tells him to go to this gentile's house and share the gospel with them and then we see that uh, his whole house hold is saved and they experience the holy spirit and so god reveals to peter through this that uh now the gentiles are also being welcomed into this community of believers so it's no longer uh, limited to the jews uh, but 
Jesus is for everyone. Um, and then we see in Jerusalem that there are more leaders who start to be raised up. Uh, so we see Barnabas, Silas, Agabus, who are new leaders who come up. So apart from the apostles, new leaders who are raised up and then sent to start churches, to lead churches in different places. Uh, simultaneously, as these churches are spreading, we also see persecution start to happen. Uh, so in AD 44 is where persecution against the Christians started to increase. And um, James, who is one of Jesus' disciples, the brother of John, is killed. Peter is arrested. Um, but the church continues to remain strong. The church in Jerusalem continues to remain strong. And this is where we see the angel deliver Peter. So when we talk about um, angelic visitations, this is one example where the angel goes and Peter is released from imprisonment and he's, uh, he goes away uh, from jail. And then we also see divine judgment on uh, the one who has initiated this persecution, which is King Herod, uh, God judges him. And so we see how God is protecting his church, even in the midst of uh, persecution. He uh, stands uh, on their side and brings judgment on those bringing persecution. Um, yeah, and so uh, one major thing that we see is there's a church that is uh, started in Antioch. I don't think this is on your map. It's Antioch in Syria. So Syria is right up here. Um, and Antioch was uh, in Syria. And the church was started there. Within three to four years, you see that there were leaders, there were prophets, there were teachers who were raised up. Uh, and it is because they were sending leaders from Jerusalem to go and invest in those churches. So if somebody can read Acts 13, 1. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, uh, what? <laughs> who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Okay, so within three to four years, they had prophets, teachers, leaders within the church. OK, so uh, that is something that is really important, right? So when a new church was being planted, there were leaders being raised up in that church. They were sending out people from Jerusalem, but they were raising up local leaders and enabling them to lead the church after that. Uh, so they could move on to new places. So some things that we can learn from this church in Jerusalem and uh, what they did to spread revival and what we can do when we experience revival, how can we go take that to other places? Uh, the first thing is to raise up believers who are strong in the word and in spirit. Uh, so these are the people who will take that revival, spread it to other places, raise up new churches, um, raise up local leaders, they'll be able to do all of those things. So if we're not raising up believers within the church and it's only the leadership who's strong, then uh, it's impossible to spread anything because the leadership will have to stay with the church, right? But if we're raising up leaders within the church, we send out those leaders, they go and start new churches and they can take what God is doing here and uh, replicate it in other places. Uh, the second is to believe God and move with him so um, that we expect God to open doors and we go to new places uh, and expect God to move in those places. So uh, going in faith and going um, and actually going, like not staying where we are. Right? We can stay where we are. We can enjoy the revival and just go on with life. Uh, but if we want to see that revival spread, then we have to trust God to move and we have to be willing to move uh, out and go and take it to other people. 
Um, the third is um, like even in the face of persecution to be able to trust God. So uh, I'll just stop sharing. I don't think we need the map anymore. Um, so not to be overcome by opposition that may come, but uh, like this church in Jerusalem, to use that as an opportunity to take the gospel to new places, if that means we're leaving where we are and going to new places, or to continue in, like they continued in Jerusalem, they remained in prayer and they trusted God to protect them, right? And God did protect them as well. Uh, we see in the case of Peter uh, and we see how he dealt with King Herod as well. Um, and then raise up and send new leaders to strengthen the churches. So not only to go start new churches, but then we're also sending out leaders to strengthen the work that has started in these new places. So while someone would go and plant a new church, there were leaders being sent later on to go and strengthen the church that had started. So having both, uh, not only planting new churches and moving on, but continuing the work that has been started, continue to strengthen those believers that are being raised. Okay, so also in this period of 10 years, we see um, Luke uh, being mentioned as someone who is working with Paul. So we see uh, some specific references in the book of Acts where he talks about being part of the work. So he was with Paul in the work that was being done. Uh, now we know a little bit about Luke, but we don't know how he came to faith, when he came to faith. Uh, we don't know too much about that. He may have uh been been part of those original converts in jerusalem or he may have been part of uh paul's home church because he was from antioch in syria that was where i showed you all syria on the map so luke was from antioch and so when paul went there he might have met paul there he might have been converted there we don't know um so but he was very much a part of paul's ministry so after this these 10 years, we then start with Paul's work. So we look at how does an individual carry revival and take it to other places. So Paul is the individual who took revival to other uh, nations, other cities, all of that. Uh, and that is Acts 13 to 28. Uh, that covers a span of 20 years of the church. OK. So um, there's a lot that we're going to cover about Paul's life, but we'll start with just some of the main points. Um, Acts 9 uh, is where we read about Paul's conversion. So on his way to Damascus, um, we saw he was going from Jerusalem to Damascus in the north, and that's where he encountered Jesus. Um, then he is in Damascus for a little bit after he encounters Jesus. He stays in Damascus for some time, preaching in the synagogues. Then from there, he goes to Arabia. Um, I think I closed that map. So uh, from there, he goes to Arabia. And then he preaches uh, for some time there. And then he goes back to Damascus for uh, the rest of those three years. So that whole time is three years from when he first arrives at Damascus, goes to Arabia, goes back to Damascus, is a period of three years. And he continues to preach. So mainly his preaching at this time is to the Jews. So he's going to the synagogues and he's preaching there. Uh, and then after that, uh, when he's, when people are trying to arrest him in Arabia, is where he escapes from Damascus, goes to Jerusalem. And he spends 15 days there. So in these first 15 days when he's in Jerusalem is the first time he's actually being introduced to the apostles. Um, he meets Peter and he meets James. These are the only two people he meets during his time in uh, Jerusalem. Um, and during this time as well, while he's in Jerusalem, he's engaging with the Jews there and he's speaking boldly in the name of Jesus. Uh, but at this time, again, his life is at risk. So there are people who are looking to kill him. And so from there, he goes to Caesarea. We saw Caesarea, which was on the coast. Uh, he went to Caesarea. And from there, he goes home to Tarsus. So that's Paul's 
uh, initial move before he starts his longer missionary journeys. So once he goes to Tarsus, we actually don't know what happened to Paul for about six to ten years. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, there's not much recorded of what he was doing in those six to ten years. Uh, it's called the silent years for in his life. Um, but what we do know is that God did a lot of work in Paul for him to then go out and start those the missionary journeys that follow. Um, so uh, he he was in. Okay, let me just pull up that map so we can just look at these places again. Sorry. Oh, I do have it up. Okay, I'll just share it. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so... Once Paul went, uh, he goes up to Tarsus, right? That's off the map, not on the map. Uh, but we see from here that he goes to Syria and Cilicia. And uh, so Syria is in Antioch, so up here. Uh, Antioch is in Syria, sorry. He goes to Antioch, and then he is, stays in Tarsus. And uh, that's where he is for those six to ten years. And then later on, Barnabas is working in Antioch in Syria. And he kind of goes to Tarsus uh, and brings back Paul to help with the church in Antioch. And they serve together for about a year. Um, so Paul was definitely an apostle and a church leader. But in this book, uh, in this subject that we are looking at. We're looking more at how did he carry revival. So that's not to not give importance to his apostleship or uh, to his leadership in the church, but we want to look at as an individual, as a person called by God, how was he uh, affected by revival and how did he then carry that revival to other places. So that is our focus when we're looking at what all he accomplished during his missionary journeys. Um, so we only have a minute, so we won't go into this. But uh, next week, because tomorrow is a holiday, we'll look at uh, Paul's missionary journeys and all that he did to spread revival. OK. Um, thank you all. If you all have any questions, anything to share, you all can do that. Um, Otherwise, we will gather next week. Yeah, you can share. Uh, what is that? Your present presentation? No, your presentation is uh, September. Let me just check. It's September fourth, eleventh, and eighteenth. It's on Google Classroom. The dates. Yes. Uh, 